Is it possible to turn that light down just a little bit back there? It's like staring into the sun. Um, all right, well, let's start with talking about that kiss. That was incredible. Um, I even worked on the show and didn't know it was coming. I was shocked when I saw it. Um, can you guys talk about how that came about, whose idea it was, how it happened? Yeah, actually, is this one? Yes, okay. Actually, that was um, a pitch from Freddie Highmore, uh, who has a tendency to want to really push the envelope on that storyline a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it, it was a little, I mean, it's a really fascinating idea that she would use something like that to try to control him in that moment. Um, and the way she played it was so beautiful because there's a lot of different interpretations of it. Yeah. But it was a little scary. I mean, I'm not sure there are that many different interpretations. <laughs> well, there are. I mean, it's like it could be, you know, a desperate mother like trying to hold on to her son. It could be a desperate mother. CPR. Trying to be <laughs> CPR. It could be a desperate mother trying to pretend like she's not aware that her son's sexually attracted to her. Right. <laughs> um, <And> but yeah. <laughs> Did you cover that a bunch of different ways? Yes, we did. Yeah. yeah, we did. But it just works. It's just, it's so part of the moment and it's so beautiful. You know, it's funny because we talked about it and we thought, okay, well, let's try it and then, you know, we'll decide editorially whether we want to put it in. And we did not actually, I think, expect that it would become the such a buzzworthy moment coming out of the finale. Um, you know, and sometimes things like that. It, it felt it felt incremental to us, but I think it felt larger to the audience. Right, right. That makes sense, and that's interesting. I'd love to talk about how the actors kind of contribute because I know that there was a huge reveal at the end of season one that became a big story in season two that I think Vera pitched to you guys. Yeah, I mean the the idea that the, that she had this. Um, allegedly incestuous relationship with her brother. And I say that just because I think, you know, there the something bad definitely happened, but the circumstances of that are, you know, meant to be somewhat shadowy still narratively. But it was her idea that um, Caleb, her brother, would be, you know, would have had this relationship with her. And we just fell in love with that idea. And then it explained her relationship with Dylan. Incredible. I mean, it really contributed so much to Dylan's kind of arc in season two. Can you talk about it all, how you kind of um, broached that subject as writers and, and kind of the debates that might have gone on of, of how to tell that story? You're doing an awesome job of sort of speaking the third person as someone who actually worked on the show this year. <laughs> like, yeah. Liz was the part of all these conversations herself, just so you know. Creator of Life Unexpected and also a member of the writing staff of Dave's season two. This is about you. This is about you. You're amazing. Um, yes, it was amazing. I very much enjoyed being there. Um, but yeah, so yeah, how do we do it? Talk about the magic. <laughs> you mean the magic of Caleb? Yeah, just how, I mean, the decision of kind of how you introduced him, how long he, he was obviously around for a short but impactful time, but his presence really contributed to the whole season arc of Dylan. I mean, as I recall, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but as I recall, I mean, we wanted to tell a story about him where we didn't villainize him, um, where we told as two-sided a story as you can tell for a situation like that. And I think one of the really fun things about the show that makes it so much fun to write for is that there's no truth it's like everything in the show is a perception. Um, and I think that that is, it, as a writer, that is so much fun because you really get to um, explore all the truths to different people and manipulate it, yeah. um, you know, for the storytelling. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and, you know, Caleb was one of the many characters you introduced this season. There was Caleb, there was George, Christine. Can you talk at all about um, kind of how you populated the town, how we populated the town a little more, <laughs> to, um, to kind of expand Norman and Norman's world, and, and was that a conscious effort? And Yeah, I mean, we, we felt that the show had been sort of in this sort of tight, insular mode in the first season, and that one of the main objects of season two was to get to know more about 
the <laughs> world of White Pine Bay, and we thought it would be um, really interesting to see Norma kind of get her dream. She moves Norma to this town with the idea being that you know she might, um, you know, that she wants to start over, that she's going to become the sort of social, get the right social circle, that she's going to have this motel, they're going to have this thriving business, and so we thought, well, let's give that to her. And let's see how close Norma can get to her dream. But I think like Icarus flying near the sun, eventually her uh, her wings melt. And there's this interesting gap between this perception that Norma has about what she's capable of doing and the person that she thinks that she can be and what she's actually capable of doing. And that was something that we thought would be fun to explore. Plus it just felt like we needed to open the town up and you know learn more about what was going on there. So um, that, you know, that became our goal, so therefore then we started coming with, well, she's got a relationship with a guy there who seems really nice and like is a really good guy, but can she actually have a relationship with a normal guy? Um, and we, you know, we love this sort of mixture in the show of really pulpy storytelling, so we have this kind of crazy drug war story going on, but then we have really nuanced character scenes between Norman, Norman, and Dylan, and that is kind of our very intentional cocktail of what we feel like makes the show work. We didn't want like super slight narrative plus really nuanced character stuff. We, we felt like, you know, the, the narrative stuff, you know, in the first season it was the select slave in the basement and this season it was the drug war. And, you know, we, we kind of like the sort of larger than life quality to the, to the narrative, but then again within that, you know, really working on making the scenes between our family members and our other, you know, and also adding in, um, you know, Nestor and Olivia and their stories, making that stuff really nuanced. Did, you know, the first season of any show is such a learning curve and as a fan of the show first season, you guys really hit the ground running from the start. But looking back, I wonder if there's, is there an episode where you guys feel like you really kind of hit your stride and found the show's voice together and found that kind of balance between that pulp and those kind of nuanced character moments that you're talking about? You know, honestly, I feel like, I feel like Carl and I just had such a good chemistry from the beginning. I felt like we, even if we didn't exactly have it on paper, I feel like we both understood what the tone of the show was and what where we wanted to go with it. I mean, I think the pilot is still very emblematic of what the show is. Um, so kind of, I feel like we kind of started out of the gate pretty well. I mean, I think what we, what we, I think finding our legs was sort of finding what the storytelling engines were going to be and how to um, tell the story of Norma and Norman in a slow enough way that it progressed and was interesting, but also that it was going to a point all the time. That makes sense. And, you know, that would be great to kind of actually talk about how you guys came together and how you kind of balance your partnership. Did you know each other before Bates? Were you fans of each other's work? How did you? I how was did 20 you? minutes late for lunch. <laughs> That's how we came together. Um, no, I mean, I, I kind of, we realized afterwards that we had met once before, like, I don't know, 10 years yeah. earlier or something like that in an executive's office, but um, basically um, Universal Television um, and A and E approached had basically made a deal with Universal. Universal Television had made a deal with A and E that they wanted to do some version of Psycho as a um, you know for television. And so uh, two executives with Universal Television sat down with me and said, "Would you be interested in doing this?" And I started churning this around in my brain. And you know, kind of my my decision making process on shows is very much kind of a a very organic and a, and non um, non intellectual one. I just found myself thinking about the idea and starting to get ideas and thoughts and, and kind of you know I, I thought oh this could be cool and I had a bunch of ideas and I said but I really would love to you know work on this with someone and Universal Television put Carrie and I together and then we sat down and I said well here's kind of what I was thinking about and then Carrie said well here's some ideas I have and they just seem to be incredibly complementary. I mean. I, I like to think of our partnership as chocolate and peanut butter. Um, <laughs> we have very different writing skills, but they go together, um, I think, in a really great way. And so we we kind of combined our ideas, and then we, it was really an incredibly great process. They originally wanted to do six episodes, and we wrote three scripts, and 
we thought that based on those three scripts, they might green light either the pilot or six episodes. And they said, you know, actually what we want to do is make 10. We're going to go, we're going to order 10 episodes. And so that's why episode six of the first season, which features Shelby dying and uh, this sort of big momentous event, that was meant to be the season finale of the first season. So then we, we decided we were not going to deconstruct what we'd done. So we just came up with this little four episode mini season, which, um, you know, uh, turned out to be actually pretty it? cool. It was, it was fun. I mean, I think we, I think the show kind of gelled actually in those four episodes in a way. Yeah. Um, it was cool. Yeah, with Jerry Burns, who was just fantastic. Awesome. Were you panicked when they told you you had to do four more after <laughs> essentially? I always panicked. <laughs> I was, I was momentarily panicked. Um, no, it just, it felt like, well, actually, this is good because I love the way shows like. 24 kind of set up an event. Oh, an atom bomb is going to go off, but it doesn't happen at the end of the season. It'll happen, you know, partway through the season. So we thought, well, it would be actually great to sort of finish the storyline in episode six when people weren't expecting it, and then we'll come up with a way to kind of extend it forward. And actually, I think it worked out pretty organically. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, can you talk about the pilot process a little bit and how you guys made the decision to kind of just different decisions you made present day? Well, my favorite one is when Carlson said we had to drop a body. <laughs> that that enough, like, literally. Because it's just not, it's not like, you know, I came from parenthood. I came from Friday Night Lights. So I, I wasn't really thinking of it quite that, you know, that, that, that large yet. Um, so that was, I mean, that was great though. I, don't, I mean, that was fun, by the way. So when when Norma and Norman go out and throw the body of the former motel, the, I'm wearing my Seafarer Motel t-shirt today, actually, in honor of the former name of the Bates Motel. And um, so when they go out and they throw Keith Summers in the water, we had to actually figure out how to do that. So we went out on a rowboat with Tucker Gates, the director, and a couple of technicians, and we had a dummy wrapped in blankets, wrapped in chains, and we had these various weights and we were trying to figure out like how fast the body needed to sink in the water so that we could actually photograph it sort of drifting down and it wouldn't float or plunge too fast so we were doing these tests and we we had dropped the body in and then we were we were pulling it back up and this group of kayakers came around the <laughs> and there's just like four dudes in a rowboat who pull this body up wrapped in blankets and chains. I mean, there's no camera around. We don't have badges. So they were like, Poof, they started hacking in the other direction. So that was, that was pretty funny. Um, you know, it's funny. It's, it's interesting when you make certain decisions and then I think whatever your intentions are, it, it's not always how the audience perceives them. So, you know, both for standards and practices concerns, and also because we felt like we didn't want to graphically, sh so there's the rape scene in the, in the pilot, and we didn't want that to be graphic, and we knew that we couldn't make that graphic on, you know, um, a &E basic cable. So we thought, well, let's just do this sort of like, kind of inspired by the shower sequence in um, the original Psycho, let's just do this by showing pieces around it. So if you actually watch that scene, you don't really see you see virtually nothing of the actual rape, but you see these kind of very horrifying images of, you know, um, the stuff sort of around it. And it turned out to be actually much more frightening and disturbing as a result of doing it that way. And I don't think that we had the perception that the opening was gonna, that it was gonna be so hard to watch. Like, I think for a lot of people, they're like, oh, that moment was like the hardest moment in the show to watch. And it, it was, it was pretty brutal. Yeah, and, and honestly, I think, you know, had we, we known that we might have you know, done it a little bit differently um, because I don't think that that's, that tone is more extreme than I think the rest of the show and isn't quite where we want the show to live. And I think, yes, I think that's true. And I think also Vera is so um, real that it just, it, you just viscerally feel it, you know, when you watch her. Um, She's incredible. Um, speaking kind of of Vera and Freddie, um, how, I'm sure you talked about it a lot approaching the pilot, but also in series, like you've managed to make these two characters where likable is not the first word that would come to mind when you think of the movie. You've managed to make them so likable and endearing and accessible. How did you kind of do that from the start and what were the conversations that, that yielded that? 
I mean, I feel like we just wanted to kind of um, love the shit out of them. I mean, <laughs> for lack of a better description, it's like they're they're really tragic characters. They're screwed up people, and we wanted to tell a story that could possibly enlighten a little bit um, that subject, um, but tell it with compassion and. Um, I think, you know, there, it really is the story of, of this woman who's just trying to have a freaking happy life. <laughs> that's, like, that's all she wants. She wants to have this simple little happy life, and I think um, that's just relatable. And, you know, when you do, you know, a, it is really a tragedy, and, and what we love about it is that we sort of subversively got to tell this tragedy. Now, if you go to a network and you say, hey, we have a fantastic tragedy for you. <laughs> You know, no one is going to buy that show. So, but you know, we saw this this story between Norma and Norman as a classic tragedy. And, and the great thing about tragedies is that you, you know, you you're hoping against hope that the characters don't meet their inevitable fate. I mean, Titanic is a tragedy. You know, you're hoping that Kate and Leo don't drown on the boat and they somehow get together. But you filled with a sense of foreboding because you know that the boat crashes and sinks. <laughs> right, and. That is, so we put a lot of emphasis into making, you know, sure that the audience would be engaged by Norma and Norman, and we've kind of fell in love with them as characters. And so I think if we do our job well as, as storytellers, we will, I think, if not sympathize, at least empathize with or understand the, the kind of path to the decisions that each of these characters makes um, throughout the series. And, um, you know, we, we, we thought that, you know, what we didn't want to do was make another dreary, monotonal, depressing serial killer story, and that the most obvious version would be just Norman, like, you know, somebody checks into the motel, he kills them, you know, like that, that we just didn't want to do the on-the-nose version of what the, I, you know, what the story might suggest. I think also Carlton and I both really are pretty we're both pretty silly people, and I think we, we like sort of a fun environment, and I think there's an element to the show that is fun because I think we would be really bummed out living in a very bleak environment for, for however many years of the series, you know, and I think, I think that's actually one of the things that's, that's really cool about the show is that I do think it's, it's a, it yeah. is fun. Yeah. There's an element to it that's fun. Raouf. <laughs> oh my God, that's my favorite. That's my favorite line of the whole series. <laughs> Raouf. There, it's true. Norma, especially. I mean, Carrie. Obviously, knowing you, there's. So, I mean, Norma really feels like half of you and half of Vera, and you can tell. I think um, in reading the show and watching the show, how much fun you have writing her. Is she kind of one of the more satisfying characters you've ever written and I, I just feel like you've infused so much light I mean when she the heartbreak of her like singing that song in the audition and when she kind of went off on the city council and was like there are murders and you know this is real life like get it together people I just feel like there's such a humor to her voice that um, well kind of we I mean we started we started talking about her I mean Norma is such an interesting collection of traits she definitely is part of Carlton's mother. She's, <laughs> she's definitely part of my mother. Um, she's actually a beautiful part of my mother, but, um, and possibly your mother too. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> but there definitely is like the psychological underpinnings of Norma, which are all about anxiety and um, abandonment and you know, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a blueprint I know fairly well. <laughs> Such a heartbreaking scene in the finale when she basically saves Norman, and you know that she's sealing her own fate. Yeah. Um, well, she has no choice. Right. It's bigger than her. Yeah, absolutely. And in terms of us knowing that you were just talking about the ending of the show, in terms, we know where the movie goes, so we think we know where the show is ending. Um, how much do you feel the need to honor that ending, and how long do you think it's going to take you to get there? Um, you know, I, I feel like we we won't we don't want to do a literal version of what is in the movie 
because I think that would feel anticlimactic, but we... <laughs> it would. Um, it would be super lame. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, the specifics of exactly what happens to them, um, we have some ideas that are, I think are good, but um, it'll, be, it'll be part of the own unique world of our story. Um, it is definitely, this is not a show that should run for 10 years. I mean, I, we feel like this year we'll have a pretty good sense of when it's gonna end, but um, I don't know, a, few, a, few, a couple more seasons after that, perhaps, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think that, you know, I would hope that we could work that out with Universal and AD and, and actually be able to tell the audience exactly how much longer is left, because well, you did with Lost, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think it's it's it is it is a story that has a beginning, middle, and end, and we want to write to the to the end of it. And it's not you know it's not like a Grey's Anatomy you know which is sort of open ended. There's always another doctor or patient that's going to walk into the hospital. Um, we want to get to the end game. <laughs> Season seven, they start working in a hospital. <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think it's going to be really fun, though, to th when you think about Psycho, and you, th you, know, you see it all from this one point of view, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier about there not being any, like, truth or reality that's, that's um, what is the word when it's, there's only one truth. Truth. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we're so good together. <laughs> um, but when you think of um, all the stuff that went on in Psycho from Norman's point of view, which we never see. We see it, you know, from the motel guest point of view, and you see it from the, the investigator's point of view, but I mean, it's so interesting to think about what the, was, was uh, Anthony Perkins, like, like doing in that house? Like, what was he thinking was going on in there, you know? And it's, it's such a rich, fascinating world that I think it's actually gonna be super fun to dig into when the time comes. Is there ever kind of, not a conflict with the network, but kind of a creative conflict versus the fact that the show is so successful in terms of wanting to keep it going? I mean, we haven't really had that conversation in great detail yet. I mean, I think we, I mean, we, I think everyone has acknowledged that the show needs to, you know, have an end point, but the specifics of saying, this <laughs> is the end point, <laughs> right. we haven't had that, we haven't worked out that, um, to, we haven't worked that out yet with them. Um, but, you know, I think that, that part will be fun. I, I, what makes writing television, you know, writing a narrative story for television is interesting is that, you know, if you do a, um, like a CSI, the storytelling is like A, B, C, D, and then you reset to A, you know, you're not moving forward. It's really fun as a writer when you get to write the end letters of the alphabet. So you, know, you look at a show like Breaking Bad, which when they did X, Y, Z, that was incredibly, Know, dramatic and compelling and interesting and we're looking forward to doing the same when we have a chance to you know we're working towards we feel like we're kind of moving into the middle of the alphabet and soon we'll be moving to the end of the alphabet and that will be really dramatic cool stuff for the viewers of the show definitive oh definitive <laughs> that's good Definitive truth. Right. I have that. <laughs> what do you guys each find kind of invaluable about the other person? What What's the piece that the other brings to the puzzle that you feel, not that you couldn't do yourself, but you oh, wouldn't do I as well? Couldn't, I couldn't do it myself. I mean, uh, Carlton is like a, um, I don't know how to say this. I, I mean, like, I, I, he's so fucking strong. <laughs> but um, I'm like I'm such a I'm such an anxious person, and I mean in a way it's where a lot of my creativity comes from. But you know, running a show is a very weird thing because it's like your whole life you've lived in your head, and then Alexander Cunningham once said, "You run a show, and suddenly they're handing you the keys to run a Footlocker." <laughs> and it's a very weird transition for people who are very internal and live in their head. And um, Carlton is such a gifted. Um, leader he really is and he is so strong and he he never operates out of fear or out of ego he's he, you're just incredibly cool <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> and I, I love that about him and i love working with him he has great ideas and he's like super fun it's like i don't know he's, you're awesome <laughs>
Well, right, right back at you. I mean, Car you know, Carrie is a amazing person and an amazing. Oh, mess. And, no, but I, I, you know, I, I love you for for all the aspects of your personality. And she's an incredible writer, and um, you know, is just responsible for so many of the wonderful sort of transcendent flights of dialogue and narrative in the show. I mean, you know, it's just, I mean, one one of the happiest things ever for me is when I read her pages and there'll be a line like, the great thing about taxidermy is it goes with everything. And I'm like, oh my God, that is so good. It's so good. So, um, you know, I, I could not do the show without her. It's so much, I mean, as, as Liz said, Norma in particular is so much of, you know, of Carrie's voice and, um, you know, it's just, it's, you know, it really is thrilling always to, to, it is. It is. to good. work with you and to see what comes out of your incredible brain. I'm going to ask a few more questions and we're going to open it up um, to you guys. Did you guys have Vera and Freddie in mind from the start? Were they discoveries that you made in casting? Or did you? Um, you know, it's hard to picture it being basically Carrie, Carrie and I started conceiving the show, and then once we had, um, you know, and as we were starting to talk about the show in its formative, even in its formative phases, I, the Vera popped into my brain as being the perfect person, you know, and, and I had kind of been in love with her from afar from her movie work, and just thought she was such an amazing actress, and when I write or work on something, I like to think of, you know, sort of prototypes. I've you know, written a lot of dialogue for George Clooney that's never been actually <laughs> come out of his mouth. Um, and I did, I just really never, like I, I, I love George Clooney. Um, uh, I, I just didn't expect that Vera would, would do it. And so when we finished the first three scripts, we sent them to her and um, with, a, with kind of a love letter. And she said she was interested and it was amazing. And um, then, April Webster, our genius casting director, basically said, I know who you guys need to have for, for um, Norman, and that's Freddie Highmore. And you know, he was this fantastic child actor. He was Charlie in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. He was in Finding Neverland with Johnny Depp. And she put us on a Skype call with him because he was going to college, um, going to university at Cambridge in England. And so charming. And we were like, wow, he's really good. But he was almost, was so, April was so definitive and so soon that we were like, okay. So then we started like looking at other actors and there was just no one. No one came close. Yeah. We just kept going back to him over and over again. And it was difficult to like get his deal worked out because he was at Cambridge. Yeah, he had, he had this, he had this inviolable six months that he had to go back to Cambridge and finish his degree, which is actually just ending in the next week or two. He will be getting his degree in linguistics from Cambridge. He is fluent in Spanish and in Arabic. Um, I think he's the only star of a television series who spent his downtime between seasons one and two translating legal documents in a law firm in Madrid from Spanish to English. I mean, that's, that's just not happening um, on other shows. All right, my last question. Favorite moment on screen? Favorite moment off screen so far of the series? Kind of, if you had to choose one. Oh, you know, it's funny, just it was, it was great to sit here and rewatch the finale and to see it on the big screen, which was very exciting. Uh, although it, it weirdly is not um, sort of the final moment of the show, the scene between Norma and Dylan, mm. to me, in the finale of season two is just really moving and sort of surprisingly to me, the, the kind of emotionally, is the most poignant scene in a certain way. For, and I, I just think that her acceptance of him is such a huge moment for that character and... It's such a victory. Yeah. We don't, we don't get to do a lot of this. <laughs> that was nice. Um, I, th I think I'm, I mean, there's so many moments that I'm incredibly fond of. I'm incredibly fond of the scene where Romero tells Norma he can see her through the window. I just love that scene. I think it's so sexy. I, I love it. Um, and, I, you know, I think probably the scene where, um, Norma tells Norman before he goes to the dance about her uh, brother, and it's just such a great scene, and it's 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 directed 
really beautifully too, so that you don't you don't know if it's real, if she's saying it to me, is she just mad because he's going to a dance, <laughs> you know, and she wants to hold on to him, but it's so, it's so incredibly heartbreaking, and then the way it just shifts into almost comedy when she's like, oh, Emma's here, <laughs> um, and I, I do love that, and I love the way this show can kind of, it's, it, it's like a trapeze where it just goes from tone to tone, and um, that's, you know, to some extent, yes, that's in the writing, but it is a real testament to the actors because it is not easy to do. Yeah. But I love that scene. And off screen, what's been your most kind of fun moment being involved with the show? Is there <laughs> a fun there's set? A, there's, a lot, there's a lot of moments of me crying. <laughs> <laughs> and Carlton telling me it will be okay. <laughs> You know, I mean, for me, I for me, it was it was just the I would say it was the entirety of the writers' room season two. So yes, it was that basically was awesome. it was it was Liz, <laughs> Carrie, um, Alex Cunningham, and Nikki Toscano, and me. So um, it was it was yeah, I was like a, I was like a guest on the View, and, um, but it was so fun. I mean, it was, it we was, just it was I, you know, I, although the. There was actually some work done, but it was actually, I don't know, you know, it was just, it was an incredible, you know, writer's rooms are really this kind of strange thing. You, you, you're kind of hoping for alchemy, and there was just an amazing um, alchemy in the room, and everybody, you know, we just, we had a lot of fun, and I, I loved that experience. Um, it was really, that was, I think, the high point for me, off screen. Yes, I'm very proud of the work we did in there, too. Yeah, me too. All right, let's open it up. Do you guys have questions? How do we do it? Do I call on people? Yeah. Okay. This is, uh, I guess, more for Carrie. Um, how how hard is it going for writing for like a family like the Bravermans, mm -hmm. on Parenthood, to like a <laughs> cast of like five or six main characters as, as opposed to like ten or eleven? The question was, <laughs> how hard is it to write for the Bravermans, which is a large cast, versus the smaller cast of Bates Motel? Like you're breaking that down. <laughs> um, <laughs> It, you know, Bates Motel is a, is a really hard show to to structure because it has such a tiny cast and it has such an intense central storyline. So, I mean, I wouldn't say any show is easy to break. I would say Parenthood because it has a large cast and you could move from storyline to storyline um, pretty pretty nicely. You know that it makes it a bit easier to break the stories um, emotionally. Like, the, like a lot of people have asked me, like, you know, how do you go from a show like Parenthood, which is so kind of beautiful and bright and sunny um, and full of humanity, to something so dark? And I, this, this says something about me. I don't actually notice the difference. <laughs> it's like I wrote, I wrote Parenthood and Friday Night Lights with the exact same sensibility. And I, yes, I did ask a couple times in the Parenthood room if I could break a chair over someone's head in the show. Like, you know, because those are the kind of fights we had at home. It was like, everyone in Parenthood is really nice, but, so, but I mean, it's a Parenthood story. Norman Norman Bates is a huge freaking Parenthood story, you know? So it's not, to me, it's not that disconnected. I think we could argue that, that Bates Motel is so good, it's actually better than Psycho. And I wonder, and uh, modesty prevents you, I'm sure, from agreeing with me. I'm not going to ask you. Anything, but d does that not uh, free you to to take that narrative in in places you choose to take it? The question um, <laughs> was framed with some ridiculously nice compliments of his motel, and then it led to a question about does does the uh, our show not free us to take us to other places? I think that. You know, for us, we made the show a contemporary prequel to get out from under the shadow of the original movie. You know, we felt like if we were um, doing it as a period piece, we would always sort of be laboring with the movie kind of up here. And, you know, we, you know, we, it just didn't seem like that was particularly interesting. I mean, I think that the movie is so iconic and awesome. And, it, you know, I think part of the original wheel turning for me was I just always loved that movie. And there were some, so many things about it that were, you know, I love, I love drama that upends expectations, and that movie in 1960 upended a lot of expectations. The yeah. heroine of the movie dies at the end of the first act. The, the shower scene was ridiculously amplified versus the other types of violence that you were seeing on screen at the time, even though it was all implied. The, uh, 
at the end, when, when the investigator shows up, um, we're sympathizing with Norman, who, you know, is the, in, a, in the antagonist in the piece. And so, like, there were all these things about the movie that were just so cool. So we sort of try to take the spirit of those things, you know, and, and we, we thought, well, let's, you know, the expectation is that the relationship between Norman and his mother is like, well, she was a horrible shrew who sort of berated him into becoming crazy, becoming a killer. Well, no, we thought, well, what if she, actually the opposite is true. She kind of loves him to death and he's got a flaw in his DNA and she, he can't really help becoming the person that he's gonna be, but, but and her sort of smothering love maybe catalyzes that. So, I don't know, doing it as a contemporary free, free prequel allowed us, I think, the freedom to go in our own direction and that's been incredibly satisfying. I the term prequel. Prequel. It prequel. Is kind of a prequel. It's a prequel. <laughs> All right, who else? Any other questions? Over here. Um, I really love Bradley. I think she, I mean, towards the end, she was a total total trooper. Yeah. Um, and I really love her as a character. I think she was really fun. And um, we know that the story kind of wrapped up with, you know, them placing the blame on Zane and, and the rest of the, those guys. but. Uh, are we going to be able to see her come back at all, or is she going for good? The question is, <laughs> is Bradley coming back? Um, we would like that, actually. You know, Nicola's kind of got a movie career. She's starring with uh, Mark Wahlberg in the new Transformers movie this summer, and she yeah. has another movie out, and so I think... But we actually were just talking about that yesterday. That exact question. So. She does feel like part of the fabric of the of the world we set up, and it would be nice to, you know, bring her back and tie her up, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> or you know, <laughs> tie her up. Um, but you know, the funny when you do a television show, you also are in this sort of pragmatic reality, and you have to deal with the availability of actors and stuff like that. So you know, we. It would be great if we could get Nicola to come back. We're, we're, we're kind of looking into seeing whether we can work that out. One last one, if anybody's got it. All right, I think we're both. Oh, wait, your hand is up. Come on, Joe. Hi. Um, <laughs> is there to be any kind of Romero Norma relationship exploration potentially? Is there going to be a Norma Romero relationship exploration? Gary. Well, being how much I love that curtain scene, <laughs> I certainly would advocate for it. I mean, yeah, we love them. We, we, uh, Romero's like an awesome character, and uh, they're, they're very interesting as a couple because they're so similar. They're both control freaks, you know, which should be really fun <laughs> and explosive. Um, and yeah, and they're both very guarded. So there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, stuff to work with there. The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you.